See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Right now, we're at a point where there's so much information in our medical records that the human brain is not capable of picking up on these small little signals on how the vital signs may be changing, how values from blood tests may be changing, and how information that's on images may be slightly changing over time. So really, you need the power of AI and these tools to pick up on those little signals that we would never be able to pick up on. And we're able to use that as an opportunity to work smarter. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Artificial intelligence has come a long way since being formally established as a field in 1956 by a group of scholars who were exploring the possibility of having machines solve problems that humans typically solve using their natural intelligence. Today, AI has evolved far past that early research and development stage and now fits into most every facet of our daily lives and increasingly into more and more aspects of healthcare and how nurses are caring for people and entire populations. With the amount of health data and the rate at which we're generating it, combined with the extraordinary computing power of machines, we're at a point where machines and an AI can see patterns we can't and tell us things we did not know, but are really glad to be alerted to before they happen. In this episode, we head to New York City to meet nurse Robbie Freeman and learn about how he and his team of clinicians, data scientists, and engineers are working with an interesting array of technology partners and building and embedding AI into hospital operations and clinical workflows to support nurses, doctors, and care teams to predict and better manage clinical situations while keeping people safe, involving patients more deeply in their care, and delivering the right care to the right person in the best way at the ideal moment. I'm Robbie Freeman. I am the Vice President of Clinical Innovation at the Mount Sinai Health System. We're an eight-hospital health system in New York City. We have a uh, top-rated medical school, We have a College of Nursing. We have a top 20 U.S. News and World Report hospital, the Mount Sinai Hospital, and many top-ranked clinical departments as well. As the hospital administrator, I oversee our emergency department. I'm also the hospital administrator for our respiratory care services, which includes all of our respiratory therapists, two departments that were very much impacted this year with the COVID-19 pandemic. The other hat that I wear is focused on digital engagement and technology. And so I lead a team of data scientists and engineers called our clinical data science team. And I also lead an initiative around technology that we're using across our hospitals to keep patients engaged with what's going on with their care. You sound like a busy guy (laughs) (laughs) who's having an awful lot of fun playing with some really cool toys. (laughs) When I first heard you speak, you talked about having a clinical data science team. Who's on this clinical data science team? What superpowers are you calling on? What problems are you solving? I have a few different responsibilities at the Mount Sinai Health System, one of which is leading our clinical data science team. We started back in 2017 with the goal of developing products that we can use at the front lines to keep patients safe. And we're a mix of data scientists and data engineers. My co-lead for the team is a physician. And really our main goal is to try and create tools that are helpful for our end users, for our frontline doctors and nurses and other members of the care team to have products that help guide clinical decision making. So there were a lot of words and vocabulary that you used in there that are not the typical words that we associate with healthcare, nurses, with patients. I want to start with product. You said you're building products. What is a product and what are you building? 
I'll try and give a couple of examples here. And for us, a product is some sort of tool that's taking in data from our different data producers. And so as a healthcare system, data producers could be our electronic medical records. It could be our laboratory system. So when you get a blood test and when we get that result, it could be images like when we take an X-ray or a CAT scan. And so we take that data, our engineers and data scientists are writing computer code to understand patterns that we're seeing in the data that are associated with some sort of outcome. We have a predictive model that identifies which patients in the hospital are most likely to fall during that hospitalization. And we went back and looked at a couple of years of data at one of our hospitals to see every patient that fell and programmatically were able to look at all the medications, all the laboratory values, different flow sheet information that the nurses entered. A lot of the tools that were in the first iteration of our medical records came from the days of paper. And Mm -hmm. at our organization, we were using a false tool that originated before EMRs existed. And we were able to take that tool and build on top of it by bringing in more information. And we ended up with a more accurate rate way to stratify patients at the highest risk. And there were really interesting things that we found, like in the nursing assessments, the nurse put the patient didn't sleep well at night. They were many times more likely to fall. If they were on certain medications, they were many times more likely to fall. I also see ways that we can just work more efficiently. One of the projects that we worked on was creating a tool that identifies which patients in our hospitals are most likely to be severely malnourished. And we know that if you can appreciate the underlying malnutrition for patients, there's lots of things that you can improve. You can improve wound healing. You can reduce the chance that they'll get readmitted. You can reduce the chance of getting a hospital-acquired infection all by treating the underlying malnutrition. And it's something that historically we haven't been great at doing. And so we created a tool that lets our registered dietitians know which patients are most most likely to be malnourished. So in a given shift, if you're able to see 10 or 12 patients, you would get the most value, you would spend your time best by seeing these 10 to 12 because these these are the ones most likely to benefit from your expertise. And these tools will allow us to spend our time in a way where we're going to get the best return, where we can help the most amount of people, and where we can improve the quality of care that we're delivering. And I think that ultimately, ultimately will continue to lead to more, more joy for our healthcare providers and more meaningful work. And so being able to tap into that vast amount of data that we have in our medical records now gives us the ability to create more accurate tools. I'm smiling at you and I'm thinking you come in with a new product, a new tool, something that's going to help. And you're speaking about the data streams and the end users and the predictions and all these other things. How are you getting people on board to say, okay, I'm in, I'm super excited when they feel like, Hey, hang on a second here. The, um, I've been doing this for 20 years. I think I got a pretty good idea of how to spot somebody who's at risk for malnutrition, dementia, altered mental status. And now you're telling me that some algorithm has come up and tell me how to do my clinical work. How's that conversation going? Yeah, you're touching on a really important point, which is around change management for some of the products that we're creating. And if you're a nurse, if you're a dietitian that's kind of worked for the past 10 years and did things one way, it's really difficult to ask someone to do things differently. What's really important is that with these initiatives that we really explain the why to why we're doing this. Right now, we're at a point where there's so much information in our medical records that the human brain is not capable of picking up on these small little signals on how the vital signs may be changing, how values from blood tests may be changing, and how information that's on images may be slightly changing over time. So really, you need the power of AI and these tools to pick up on those little signals that we would never be able to pick up on. And we're able to use that 
as an opportunity to work smarter. And the goal is never to replace clinical judgment. The goal is not to replace our nurses or dietitians or care team members. The goal is to give tools that can help augment our practice and help us work smarter and allow us to care for more patients in a way that's more effective. So Robbie, you sit in a really interesting place in healthcare innovation, where you really have the benefit of the 30,000 foot view. So given where you sit, can you just give a little bit of an overview of, I guess, let's start kind of with the digitization. You mentioned paper. How did we go from paper to where we are at a keyboard and digital and electronic health records? So that's a really interesting question. When I graduated nursing school in 2009, it was a year where there was an economic depression under the Obama administration. They had what was called the High Tech Act of 2009. And what that did was it incentivized hospitals and healthcare delivery systems to adopt electronic medical records. Now, that was only 11 years ago, but at that time, only 9% of hospitals had basic electronic health record or EHR adoption. And, well, and, and you said now, the hospitals, but let's remember that there are all of these primary care practices, which had even less, like way less than that as far as their electronic health records. That's right. And if we think about skilled nursing facilities yeah. and other areas of healthcare delivery, you're right. The adoption was even lower than that. And so very little was electronic not that long ago when I started my career. And now we're at a point where the majority of healthcare organizations have fully electronic medical records. And that's certainly true for hospitals. And so that incentive back in 2009 really served as a catalyst to get health records digital. I also think that we're at a point in healthcare where things are moving towards the consumer. And we're seeing the rise of these platforms. You may be familiar with companies like Hims and Hers. Hims and Hers is a healthcare delivery platform that focuses on asynchronous healthcare visits, all electronic and platform based. And they started off in the types of things that you may be embarrassed to talk to your doctor about hair loss, sexual dysfunction other topics that may be uncomfortable to have conversations around. And they're quickly moving into other domains of treatments and, and other telehealth-based care delivery options. And they set out to solve the problem of how difficult it can be to have these conversations with your provider and also kind of the lack of consumer centricity and healthcare delivery. These platforms are starting to really um, grow and they're becoming multi-billion dollar companies because they're able to create consumer focused and consumer centric healthcare delivery. When you look at things like the net promoter score of healthcare organizations, we're much lower than most other industries. If you look at retail, if you look at banking, even healthcare delivery organizations fall pretty low on the list, on par with the DMV and slightly higher than the cable companies. I think that leaves an opening. Mm -hmm. It leaves an opening for technology companies to create what they're really good at creating, which is consumer focused products and solve for the treatment areas where as health systems, we haven't done a really good job at building a consumer experience around. You mentioned that there's been an awful lot of digitization. And that was really the first step of transition, hopefully leading to transformation. So we're on this historical journey. We've done that part of digitizing our medical records and creating portals for people to access it. What do you see is next on this journey? I mean, there's a lot of opportunities, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think during that first iteration uh, of the electronic health record, what we started with was just taking the things we did on paper mm -hmm. and doing them on the computer. <laughs> and I really think that at that time, we had an underappreciation for how these tools will really be central to our workflows, to the workflows of nurses, to the workflows of other members of the healthcare team. And we're at a point now that many organizations have been on the electronic medical record for, let's say, close to 10 years. We can take a pause and think about 
what should the next iteration of these tools look like? And we have an opportunity now with advances in machine learning, with advances in AI and things like natural language processing, where we can bring more efficiency, where we can improve the quality of care and patient safety. I know, Shauna, we had talked a little bit about how it's always been the promise of these tools to give time back to the care team. And that promise oftentimes doesn't feel like it's been realized. And I think in this instance, we have an opportunity to bring joy back and bring authentic relationships back between nurses and our patients. And I think that we want to have these tools not coming between us and our patients, but really augmenting the care that we're given. And one of the reasons I ended up working in this space was because I was frustrated with how much time we would spend on data entry and how much of my shift as a nurse working at the bedside would be just typing information into the computer where can often not be looked at again uh, by anyone. And with machine learning and with AI, we can tap into that valuable information. We can create tools that are automated and we can free up our care team from the tyranny of data entry and really give them back the meaningful experiences that we should be having with our patients. Your team has been using these tools to solve these problems. You guys have been doing that for a while. And then all of a sudden, March comes along and everybody's world turns upside down. And where you are in New York, you're amongst the very first in the U.S. to see this dramatic upsurge in hospitalization, severity of cases, having to dramatically rethink, did that push that work to the side or have some other impact? You know, we, we were watching this in January and February and seeing how things were unfolding in Wuhan and in Europe and Italy. And our response back in March to the first wave of COVID-19 Early on, before we had our first patient, which was March 1st for New York City, we started to look at how could we model what we might expect if and when COVID-19 reaches New York City. And it turns out that some of those models were helpful in informing our emergency planning team kind of what we may be able to expect. And we partnered with some epidemiologists from our department of medicine uh, with a data scientist named Bethany Percha, who really helped us develop models that were able to tell us, you know, what can we expect in terms of how many patients may hit our ICUs? And we were able to take that information and create different scenarios in terms of when would we potentially run out of hospital beds? When would we potentially run out of things like ICUs or ventilators? And that was able to inform our decision-making around equipment, around supplies, around staffing and personnel. And that epidemiological modeling was helpful. Some of the other ways our clinical data science team was able to support our COVID-19 response included some questions that came very early on from our clinical leadership. So they asked us, can we identify of the patients who get admitted, which ones are most likely to end up getting transferred to one of our ICUs? Which patients may end up intubated on a ventilator? Which patients may end up having some sort of kidney issue and requiring dialysis, which was a bit of a challenge during that first wave where we saw a large increase in the number of patients who require hemodialysis. And finally, who are the patients who are starting to get better so we could discharge them quickly and create more capacity to care for more patients? That one in particular was helpful because we were finding that some of the patients who were recovering from COVID-19 had some complex discharge needs, like needing to go home with supplemental oxygen. And so it was taking a long time because the supply chain was constrained back in March to get them set up with that. And if we could identify who's getting better, we could start that planning a couple of days earlier. So when patients were medically ready, we could send them home and create more space for more patients. So your front line to so your nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists were, I would imagine coming to you saying, 
begging maybe, okay, guys, now time to get your superpowers out. Help us figure out who needs what and when. Is that how, I mean, that sounds like what I'm, what I'm hearing. Yes, exactly. Uh, myself, our, our hospital president, Dr. David Rich, uh, and others would be out there on our COVID units, you know, talking to our care team members, rounding, hearing about what the pain points are, mm-hmm. and trying to understand ways we could best support our response. And many of the areas we ended up working on were due to feedback that we got from our frontline care team members. What was that like when you were rounding? I mean, what did it look and sound like when you were out there? Yeah, I vividly remember back in March and April, the way that care was being delivered looked a little bit different than it had previously. We had our IV pumps running oftentimes from outside of the patient room where we, we found the way the nurses in a very innovative fashion were able to come up with a solution where we could run our IV pumps with extended tubing, be able to make changes to medications from a bit of a distance where they could stay safe. We also, as we were concerned that we may run low on respiratory devices, we ended up coming up with a partnership with Tesla. Elon Musk and the Tesla Foundation actually reached out and said, hey, we have a bunch of these ventilators. They were home BiPAP devices. And they said, if these could be useful for you guys, we'd be happy to send you as many as you would need. And we ended up working with our sleep lab and our anesthesia sim center to come up with a protocol that we could turn these home ventilators, home BiPAP machines, into hospital-grade ventilators. And not only that, we were able to come up with ways to remotely monitor these ventilators and make setting adjustments from outside the room. And so the Tesla Foundation ended up sending us over 300 of these, and we had a team of medical students in our library which we ended up turning into a little ventilator factory where we were setting up these devices in the event that we were to run low on our respiratory devices, we would have these available. Now, fortunately, we didn't get to that. We were able to get by with the ventilators and BiPAPs and high flows that we had procured, but we did have that available in the, in the case that we, we were to run out. We did not want to see any patients go without a ventilator. And so this innovation and in in our amazing team of researchers and medical students really came together to create this hospital-grade ventilator protocol. And we published that on our, our website on mountsinai.org. That way other organizations can learn from the work that we did. You had a lot of really interesting partnerships. Once you guys put in the negative pressure rooms and converted all of the, uh, I, I guess it's probably your ICUs, but many of these that you mentioned that you've got the, the pumps on the outside of the room in an effort to reduce the amount of exposure to the virus, managing, being good stewards of your PPE, but it created a new problem. You can't really see your patients. So you guys had a really interesting partnership with Google in their Nest Cam. Can you describe how how all of that came into being and what that solution looks like? That's right. And so one of the things I kept hearing as we were rounding in our COVID units was that the nursing team really wanted visibility into the room. So as you mentioned, with the negative pressure, we need to keep our doors closed to, to mm-hmm. maintain that pressure. So our facilities team was incredible. They created these cutouts and put these HEPA filters in, in all the rooms They would ventilate outdoors through the HEPA filter, through a cutout, kind of wooden cutout that was mounted in the window. And we needed to keep that door closed to maintain the negative pressure. That keeps the virus particles from leaving the room. But the other challenge it creates is that it reduces our visibility. And so we ended up coming up with this remote patient monitor and console that we built with Google. And so the Google team, the Google Nest team reached out and they said, any way we could help support what's going on, we see what's happening in New York, just tell us how we can help. And they sent us a whole bunch of consumer grade Nest cameras. And these are cameras that you could just, they would stick on the, to the wall. We would put them on uh, whiteboards in the room. And at the nurse's station, we would set up a monitoring console. So our inpatient units are about 35 beds and We would have a nurse or a nursing assistant sitting there keeping an eye on patients. And we were able to, since we couldn't 
actually see into these rooms, we're able to use this two-way audio, one-way video to keep an eye on our patients. We worked with a Google engineering team day in, day out to create different features, including the ability to put these cameras in privacy mode in case the patient was having a bath or having a procedure done. We could There was a privacy option where the light in the room would turn off so they knew no one was watching and we would turn it off from the console. Um, and it gave us the ability to just have that extra set of eyes on our patients and make sure that they were safe, even when we couldn't see into those rooms. I'm curious, did it help patients feel safer from the standpoint of, I I know oftentimes when I uh, have been in those hospitalized settings, patients worry, what happens if I fall? What happens if my IV stops? What happens if I stop breathing? And they have a certain level of anxiety because they don't know if anybody can see them. There's also the anxiety of like, somebody's watching everything I do. But (laughs) in this instance, it's probably a little bit more of the former where they're concerned that people aren't watching them. What was the impact that that had on patient sense of confidence or feeling secure and safe? I think on our our COVID-19, designated COVID-19 units, they, it absolutely gave an extra layer of safety uh, for, for patients and their family members. Remember that family members and visitors were pretty restricted back then. And it continues to have, yeah. we continue to have restrictions. And so the only way that patients could re- communicate with their family were kind of zoom tablets that we would provide. Um, or if they have a, you know, personal cell phone, they could communicate that way. But that extra set of eyes was comforting to patients and their family members. But interestingly, as we were on our way down from the first wave, when units went back to being kind of your regular kind of, kind of patient population, there was uncomfortableness with the, with the Nest Cams. And we ended up deciding to only use them within our COVID-19 units because it's not something we would normally do for a patient population outside of the pandemic. So I do think for the long term, we're going to have to figure out, is this something that patients and families are comfortable with kind of having that level of continuous monitoring? Or does it only make sense in certain kind of scenarios where there's a patient safety risk or something else going on where we need to kind of have that extra level of monitoring? So uh, families are not there. How are you connecting them and what are the partnerships that, you know, the technology solutions and the partnerships that you had to put in place to solve the problem of families being disconnected? We, we ended up having a fantastic partnership with Zoom around what we call our virtual visit program. And so when we realized that we were going to have to severely restrict visitation based on some of the guidelines we had in New York State and New York City, we reached out to the Zoom team and they ended up providing us with thousands of free accounts. And we were able to use these accounts to set up hospital provision tablets that had Zoom on them. And we came up with a process where any care team member and any patient can request a virtual visit with their family, their loved ones, their partners. And our patient rep team would actually set up those as a Zoom meeting. So it was helpful in many ways because we can communicate to the care team that during that time, we can try and give the patient protected time to kind of spend with their family and plan our care around that time. And it allowed us to make sure that We could have some support in ensuring that that connection happens between the patient and their family. And we did many thousands of virtual visits per month during March, April, May. And we continue to do those to this day. And we've done them in all care settings from hospice to med surge to ICU to labor delivery because there was a period of time in New York City where there was visiting restriction on partners for deliveries. And so there were Zoom virtual visits with moms when they were delivering. And it was just the best way we were able to connect patients with their loved ones, their partners, their, their families. So this feels like a, um, a, a virus of itself from the standpoint of infecting people with the idea of, oh, we can be working with all sorts of partners and playing with all sorts of different technologies. What are some of the others that were unexpected to you, people reaching out and saying, hey, I want to help. Um, Here's what I have. What problem might it solve? You know, there were many. Everyone from uh, the Microsoft team had actually, through their AI for Health program, Mm -hmm. 
ended up giving us a large grant to support all the cloud computing resources that we needed to build these algorithms and to train these models. Some members of the, the finance community, so one of the big financial firms, had actually reached out to say, we have this team that has an expertise in machine learning and engineering, and if there's any way they could be helpful, we'd be glad to do some pro bono work. And we ended up partnering with one of the large firms and they brought in a fantastic team of engineers. And in seven weeks, we did seven big projects with them that allowed us to take products that were created by our researchers in the organization and very quickly connect those products to our clinical data science team so we could test them behind the scenes. So these can run silently behind the scenes across our hospitals so we can understand how it works before we would bring a research product into operations. And so one example of that was the model to identify which patients are most likely to need hemodialysis. It was created by a research team from nephrology. They built this model. They were able to throw it over the fence, as we say, like hand it off to our our data science team. We were able to implement this behind the scenes and test how well it works. And those types of collaborations between researchers and hospital operations have been challenging in the past. And some of those barriers to entry and some of those silos that we've had previously are getting uh, broken down through the COVID crisis. And now it's becoming easier than ever to take research products and bring them into hospital operations. Whereas in the past, oftentimes a research team may Uh, create something, publish the paper, and then the effort kind of ends there. It doesn't go the next step of operationalizing the tool that they created. There are some other fantastic partnerships. We ended up bringing in a wearable product from a company called Massimo so that we could have wireless finger sensors for pulse oximetry, so monitoring the oxygen saturation within the blood. And we were able to put this on patients in the room and stream that information outside of the room. We also save that information so we can create better algorithms with more data so we could predict early clinical deterioration and understand if patients may be at high risk for heading towards the ICU. I think, Shauna, your background is critical care. Yeah. You're saying you've worked in the ICU and you probably- I, absolutely. And I, you know, when you're talking about Massimo, I, I've, it's, it's a really fascinating space because they've been over on human performance, health and wellness, fitness, the optimization of your, your workouts. And a lot of these companies who have those types of wearable technologies have been slow. I mean, they, they see the potential, but healthcare is not always easy to work with. And it's interesting that the wellness portion of, of the healthcare sector doesn't really oftentimes come over into the healthcare as in hospitalization, disease management, chronic, chronicity, uh, surveillance. I think the reason that they haven't is we haven't necessarily been the easiest to work with. The regulations involved with the, the payment models, you know, it's just not, not easy as opposed to going direct to consumer. The types of partnerships and the problems that you're solving I get really excited about that. I mean, when you're talking about this data, so much of the data as far as our health experiences, our health um, outcomes, is restricted to what exists in the electronic medical record. And in order for us to really address the human and social services, we're going to have to work with partners that are creating data through other streams. And these types of collaborations with with a Zoom or with a Massimo, which have been predominantly in the consumer space, where people actually live their lives, where health actually happens. I get super excited about working with new partners and working with new data sets. And how do we actually integrate that in so that when we say an electronic health record, it really is a health record that has digital data and it's not here is the record of your hospitalization or, you know, some of the visits that you may have had in some of those other care settings that were highly regulated, but don't really look at how well did you sleep? Did you have a good conversation with somebody in your family? Um, How many steps did you walk? Did you walk? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think at this moment in time with all of us sitting in front of a camera, 
I know I'm certainly not doing the same amount of moving that, that I had been doing. The, you know, there's so many interesting facets to that. And one of the other parts that I found really fascinating about the work that you guys have been leading within your institutions is the stuff that's not technical. Um, you guys rounding and walking around looking and seeing what's going on, you saw firsthand the amount of stress that our nurses, our respiratory technicians, environmental services, um, palliative care, uh, our clergy, nobody is not feeling this. And you decided to bring in a non-technical solution for this. Can you say more about how you're addressing the emotional and um, physical well-being of your care teams? You cannot underestimate the need right now for people just to have conversations to talk about what we went through during the first wave and what we're continuing to see. The focus has to be on wellness and the well-being of our care team members and our employees at large, because this was very much a team effort to support the pandemic, whether we're talking about our IT colleagues or engineering who created these negative pressure rooms overnight to food services, you name it, we were all impacted. And one of the things that we've done at the Mount Sinai Health System is we have a, um, a pet therapy program just for employees. Mm. And so one of the ways that we're thinking about employee wellness is uh, what started off as a pet therapy program for, for patients, we've, in a partnership with Petco, we've um, now, over the past year or so, have an additional uh, therapy dog that comes <laughs> and visits with employees. And I know that as a dog lover myself, I kind of light up when the pet therapy dog makes the rounds. And the dog goes around and meets with employees and people just get a five minute break. There's also a chi cart through our spiritual care department has a chi cart program where we have the ability for care team members to just stop, listen to some relaxing music, have some tea if, if they so choose. There are some different lavender oils and different types of like aromatherapy kind of options as well. It's all part of our focus on wellness and well-being. The other way that we're trying to understand the impact of stress on our healthcare workforce is a program called our Warrior Watch. And we've been giving out Apple Watches to employees. We have many hundreds uh, in enrolled across the health system to collect data from those devices to really look at what, it, what has been the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on stress, health, and well-being of our workforce. And um, in the Apple keynote uh, this fall, Tim Cook actually spent a bit of time kind of talking about this program at Mount Sinai and how we're going to gain some new insights into kind of the stress that's, that our frontline care team members are seeing. We're also looking at if we can use that data to predict COVID-19 infection before patients know that they have uh, tested positive and we'll be, there'll be some publications in the coming weeks and months around um, the ability to take information coming off a wearable device and see if there's some signal there that can identify uh, if someone tests positive for COVID-19. You talk about precision nursing. And I think that the example that you just gave with the Apple Watch being able to understand who's experiencing what, when they are experiencing it, what that might lead to, and our ability to know when to intervene and what to intervene about is this wonderful precision. And so precision nursing, what is it and what are you thinking about in terms of coming up with this term and what that makes possible? Yeah, so... I as you know, Shada, that nurses are the largest part of the healthcare workforce. Mm -hmm. And we have an opportunity here to create tools that are going to lead to transformational change. Precision nursing is our ability to amplify and improve the different tools that we have at our disposal to care for patients. And I talked a little bit about creating better tools to predict falls, but that same 
approach can be used for so many of the other tools that we use within our nursing practice, both Mm -hmm. within the hospitals and at a population level, and can allow us to be more precise about the care we're, we're giving and allow us to take patient quality and safety to the next level. And so we're seeing not only in the case of falls, but things like uh, some traditional tools that we use to identify delirium, some tools that we use to identify clinical deterioration, and tools that we can bring in from the community. So you talked a bit about remote monitoring and our ability to kind of tap into data from consumer devices and wearables that patients may be using in the community. And I think precision nursing is going to allow us to take all that data and turn it into very precise treatment plans and allow the nation's largest workforce to use these tools to do what we do best, which is to advocate for our patients, to keep them safe, and to deliver high quality care. What are some of the moonshots, the the really high aspiration with data and uh, this, this concept of precision nursing, what are some of the things that have been problems that have seemed too hard, too costly, that now it becomes a data problem that we could actually take on? There's the ability to really tap into multimodal data sets. And by that, what I'm talking about is things like genomics. Mm-hmm. So the promise of taking data from genomics, combining that with data, let's say from images, combining that with data that you have off like your Fitbit or your consumer device and really getting that full picture of health. You know, that's been the promise for a long time. We're slowly getting there. And I think that, you know, in the near future, we will be able to give an additional layer of insights by combining genomic data with data from your acute care hospital episodes with data from the community. And I think that that will come together to to give us a, a, a picture of health. I do think that we'll continue to do remote monitoring in the community as well. I spoke today about some of the hospital patient monitoring because during the COVID-19 crisis, there was an urgent need. But we also have initiatives within our communities, including a program where we're having our pharmacist titrate a hypertension medication for patients mm. with high blood pressure, where we give patients a, a blood pressure cuff and a scale, and they can send us back data on an ongoing basis. And then we can make adjustments. We can allow pharmacists to practice at the top of their license and make titration adjustments to medications to keep patients in the right range for their blood pressure medicine. There are some barriers. We want to make sure that we're creating tools that are equitable and that for patients from different socioeconomic backgrounds, let's say that may not have Wi-Fi or a data plan or a smartphone to stick these devices with, we want to make sure that it's as accessible to those communities as any other community that we would serve. And so I think we're going to want to be really thoughtful and how we create these remote patient monitoring programs and make sure that inclusion is top of mind. Yeah, you touch on a really important point here. Our AI, our our algorithms are built based on data. And if we don't have data sets that reflect the broad and full range of our communities, those things that you were talking about running in the background, we run the risk of accelerating an existing bias. We'll just get more efficient about it because we haven't used data sets that really reflect the full breadth and experience of our communities. Speak to that from the standpoint of how are you protecting to make sure that as we use these really powerful tools, we're doing it in a way that creates inclusion and fairness and much more equitable experiences than we have had. It's a really important question. I think We should be mindful in healthcare of ways that AI and big data tools have been used in other industries to disenfranchise certain communities. And um, there's a fantastic book that I love from Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction, which highlights ways that tools have been created where there was racism and bias in data products. And one example was from the criminal justice system and these uh, recidivism algorithms that were created by private vendors and would end up 
recommending harsher sentencing recommendations to judges for African Americans versus Caucasians. We've seen examples of this in the credit scoring industry and in, in finance, and we want to make sure that healthcare does not make some of those same mistakes. So one thing that we do for all of our the models that we work on is we look to see if there's any bias by um, by race, and we look at performance mm-hmm. across, across race. And you can do some calibration to make sure that there's fairness in the model. We can also look at ways that we implement these tools to ensure that no one group, whether it's by race or socio socioeconomic status is getting disproportionately impacted by the way that we implement the models. And we can make sure that we have fairness that way. But it's an important question. And for each one of the tools that we create, we always ensure that there's no adverse racial implications or bias in the model. And then it's something we will address if we see that. So the tech industry, that's the other group where oftentimes I think that they have been unaware, maybe a little bit shy, Uh, uncertain about where nurses would fit on their product teams, their technical teams. What, you know, you've clearly been having a lot of interactions with uh, our tech industry partners. What are they learning and what would be your invitation to them to say, you are missing out on enormous amounts of clinical insight, practical operational wisdom that you really need in developing products that work? Yeah, I think they're they're totally missing out. Such a large part of healthcare delivery is done by nurses. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the 23 hours and 45 minutes of the day in the hospital, but it's the nurses there with patients. And same could be said, you know, within the community and other settings. And so I think right now it's a missed opportunity. You'll see some tech companies starting to have nurses in leadership positions. Microsoft, they have a number of executive level yeah. uh, nurses. And there could be more of it. If we want to be successful in this complicated space of healthcare, we have to be talking to nurses and we have to be partnering with people who grew up in the trenches and really understand what care delivery looks like on the front lines. That way we can create products that meet the needs of our patients and that fit in with healthcare delivery workflows. If we were to look throughout time on some of the most important and transformational events in history in healthcare, many of them were led by nurses. And if we go back to the days of Florence Nightingale, which in many ways, she was using data and visualizations to create change. And if you see the beautiful Coxcomb diagrams that she had created during the Crimean War to show that more soldiers were dying from preventable illness, than on the battlefield, or if we were to talk about Clara Barton uh, within public health, and the you know the you know starting the Red Cross, and you name it. If you go throughout time, so many of our most transformational healthcare events were led by nurses, and we will continue to see that. And I encourage healthcare companies, healthcare technology companies to start to realize the value that you know nurses bring to the table. One of the things that we're realizing is that across our hospitals, we're able to take tools like our patient portal. And we oftentimes were thinking of these portals as outpatient tools, but more and more, particularly this year with the pandemic, we're seeing that these can be used on the inpatient side as well. So one of the things that we've done at Mount Sinai is that when a patient gets admitted to one of our hospitals, we push an alert through their portal. This is in partnership with Epic, our medical record company, and we're able to turn it into a in-hospital view. So patients can see in real time what's going on. So it'll show things like who's caring for me, who's my frontline nurse, and what do they look like? In particular, during a time where everyone's wearing a mask, it's yeah, nice you have to see no people. idea. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> nice to see a face. And yeah. as you know, so many different people can come in and out of a patient room on the course of a given day, a given shift. So we're able to show you the different members of the care team: your frontline nurse, your frontline doctor, you know, social worker, uh, respiratory therapist. So you can know at any given time, in real time, who's caring for you. We show your itinerary for that day so you know what to expect because when you're in the hospital, it's a time where you don't have a lot of control. 
Yeah. And anytime we can empower patients to really have control and an understanding of what they can expect, it's an important thing. And so we can show, you know, when you're going to, when we're going to come and get your blood and when you're going to get medications, when you may go for a test or procedure or to radiology, and you can see what your schedule is for that day. And I think most importantly, we're able to use these tools to push patient education. And so I'll give you one example of how we're yeah. doing this. We've started a program in our department of surgery. So when patients come in with a cer- having a certain type of uh, bowel surgery uh, mm-hmm. called, uh, they're having an ostomy place. So they're having a device that's going to go outside your body where we're going to reroute some, some, some. Your fecal matter. From your gut. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Shauna. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it requires some knowledge on the patient side on how to care for this appliance. Mm-hmm. So when the fecal matter is coming out through uh, incision, that's little pouch. Abdomen, yeah, a little, little pouch, pouch there. Mm -hmm. And what we're able to do is after that surgery, we push out a video so a patient can hear from someone who's been through it. Mm -hmm. And so before the wound ostomy care nurse comes in, who is going to do some specialized teaching about that ostomy, we're able to have the patient hear from someone who's been through it. And what we've seen, we've been studying this, what we've seen is when we can combine some digital education with the real in-person education patients have a better understanding of how to care for that ostomy. And we're seeing that these examples where we're combining the digital and the in-person, we're getting a lot of value in terms of patients being able to have a better understanding and comprehension of their care. And I think this is going to be more and more the way that we will be delivering care in the future and we can create these automated tools behind the scenes that can help deliver the right content to the right patients at the right time. I am cheering, jumping up and down with the thought of this. It sounds so much like somebody preparing your flight itinerary or your travel itinerary. And you're right. There's not the sense of control. You have no idea who these folks are coming in and out of your room, what role they play. And I think oftentimes we forget that when you are in an inpatient setting, you're usually there because you're sick. So trying to manage the fact that you don't feel well, that you are scared, that you're naked oftentimes, and you've got all these folks coming in, it's just such a shift in the power dynamic. There's so many things going on that to be able to have not only the preparation, but then also the recap, because your family's asking, well, who came in? What did they say? What, you know, what's their background? What's their discipline? Why are they in? There's so many questions. So these types of tools that really orient people, I love that you have this underway. And I'm curious, how many people are calling you and saying, Robbie, how do we do, how do you do this? How do we do this? Have you, it's because I know you're publishing things and you're speaking about it, but I love the fact that you are sharing this so readily so that more people can, A, get over the idea like it's too hard, it can't be done. You've dispelled that myth. Secondly, seeing the tools that you're using and then becoming a resource. So we're going to be sending a lot of people your way. Robbie, can you help our system do this? How much work like that are you guys doing? Yeah, I mean, we're always happy to share kind of the work that we're doing with other healthcare mm-hmm. organizations. And it's a small community, so we all, we all talk. And um, I tweet I, and post. And- <laughs> Exactly. And I've certainly been fortunate to learn from others as well and many other health systems. So there's really no secrets in this work. We want it to spread. We want it to share. I think nurses are really best positioned to advocate for these types of tools and advocate for roles within their organization. You know, there wasn't a VP of clinical innovation before me. I just kind of like created this path and this role. And I want to encourage nurses from everywhere to kind of think the same way just because the role like this hasn't existed before. Here's your opportunity to be the first. The other thing I did want to comment is how beautiful it is to support people in a very life-changing way, an ostomy, a mastectomy. We do any number of amputations. There are any number of types of treatments that we are providing people that change their outward identity, their confidence level. It impacts the way they're going to conduct their lives, whether it's an insulin pump, and how important that is to bring in people who have that lived experience and bring it in a way that I can interact with it 
in my own comfort level, if I want to look at it at a video and I just want to cry and I want to be angry, I can do all of that and I can have some level of awareness so that when the human beings come in and we have that real-time education, maybe I'm in a better place to hear it. I cannot tell you the numbers of times when I've had conversations with patients, giving them education on something that's really devastating, not something that they want to talk about. And I know it's their anger speaking at me. I know it's their frustration or the sense of unfairness. And they've apologized to me later. No apology necessary. You know, you come in there with that empathy and you know how difficult that is. But the way you've set up this innovation in it and really rethinking what that looks like, when they hear it, how they hear it, who they hear it from, I, um, it really touches my heart. I think about how many difficult conversations that we have to have. And maybe those conversations get better for everybody. And maybe the people who have moved along in that life experience that are living with things that they didn't wish for, maybe it, it's helping them also to um, cope better with the set of circumstances they have. So I just, um, it warms my heart. And I'm so grateful that there are people like you who have a set of skills and a set of sensitivities and a set of enthusiasm to bring these efforts and initiatives and solutions forward. So good on you, Robbie Freeman. We're all a lot better off for all the work that you're taking on and leading and encouraging other people to, to dive into. Thank you. And I think as nurses, you know, the type, the phenotype that goes into nursing and that empathy that comes with kind of the work that we do, kind of bringing that into these, the, the way that we use these tools is just so important. And it's just one more reason why we need kind of the nurses at the forefront of creating these programs. Nurse Robbie Freeman is the Vice President of Clinical Innovation at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, where he oversees the emergency department and also serves as hospital administrator for respiratory care services, two departments which have been and continue to be at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic. As Vice President for Clinical Innovation, he obsesses on ways to use technology to work smarter to keep people safe and patients better engaged with their treatment, to work more efficiently, to deliver super high quality care that is fair, equitable, and ethical, with joy and delight built right into the design. He's also the co-director of the clinical data science team and leads a team of data scientists and engineers charged with creating tools to help guide care teams with clinical decision-making Using AI and data, they build all sorts of products to improve clinical workflows and hospital operations. When he's not building interesting partnerships, ventilator backups, or predictive models, you can find him snuggled up with a hospital's pet therapy dog. Experts, trend watchers, and industry observers predict that data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are likely to have a bigger impact on healthcare than anything the healthcare sector has experienced in our lifetime. Before, but especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing clinicians and data scientists working in new ways using AI to predict, screen for, and diagnose a variety of clinical situations. Working with ops teams, vendors, and community partners to manage supply chains, facilities management, and durable goods for home care. AI is helping researchers develop new medications, therapies, and vaccines faster without compromising safety. In fact, these powerful tools seem to be improving safety. It's critical. Well, actually, it's kind of fun for nurses to get up to speed and comfortable adopting and developing AI in the full spectrum of where health and care is happening in understanding the risks and opportunities that go along with AI. Seeing this growing need to prepare nurses for AI adoption and understanding that we only get things done in partnership, the American Hospital Association connected with Microsoft to create a free continuing ed course designed especially with nurses in mind. You can find it by searching for artificial intelligence and the path to innovation at aha.org. While some might wonder, if AI tools might take humanity and the human touch 
out of care, what Robbie sees is that it's actually helping to return our human authenticity and presence to caring while speedily driving innovation, creating new possibilities, and improving health outcomes. It's ushering in what Robbie describes as precision nursing and enhancing our ability to care for more patients in new ways, in new places, safely, with precision. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to See You Now wherever you get podcasts. And we'd so appreciate it if you share the show with your friends. It really helps us out. And if you have a moment, drop us a line and let us know what you think of the show. Hello at seeyounowpodcast.com. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.